everyone and welcome to the gazing table it's really great to have you with us at the india today conclave and what we hope to do over the next 45 odd minutes is to go across all these uh, tables and to understand and hear from some of the people who've joined us at the gazing table about what to expect over the next five years you know as all the opinion polls are predicting at this moment it seems that there is a high probability that the narendra modi government will get re-elected and if that happens in the field of national politics state level politics business foreign affairs how is india likely to change so the whole idea is for you to tell us things we don't know there's a lot that's written about you know it's the gazing table because we are gazing into the future you're all experts uh, in various areas and you know things we don't so gaze into your crystal ball and tell us what you think will happen so i want to get started with uh, this interaction by getting india's top television journalist rajdeep sardesai to kick things off for us and tell us how at the national political level rajdeep you see things change over the next five years. What may happen which we're not anticipating? What may happen which is different from what we're seeing in front of us? Rahul, if our numbers are right, and there is a, it's a remarkable uh, election in the sense that I don't think one has seen an election where month before the election, every opinion poll is moving in the same direction and a certain predictability and inevitability seems to be there over the outcome. So if our numbers are right, Rahul, which is what, 350 to 400, for the BJP and its allies, I think we are seeing a distinct sign of Indian parliamentary democracy moving towards what I call a single party, single leady, a leader, quasi-autocracy. I use the word quasi-autocracy deliberately because I believe Modi's India is not Erdogan's Turkey, it is not Putin's Russia, which are frankly full-blown autocracies. There is a history of democratic contestation and political pluralism that can't just be shoved aside in a decade or a decade and a half. But I do believe that the rise of this quasi-autocracy, as I call it, will have serious implications in the Indian context. And I'll just flag off four very quickly. First is the weakening of our constitutional democratic pillars. Legislature, judiciary, and I know we are in a media conclave, but bloody hell the media too. Uh, Number two, center state relations, which I think will become more and more fraught. Already we are seeing it, the announcement or the push towards a one nation, one pole could be met with resistance, but fundamentally you will see an undermining of federal principles with decisions being taken in Delhi and rammed down. So we saw it with the farm laws and you will see resistance in different parts of the country as you move towards this quasi autocracy. The second will be, uh, the third will be a north-south uh, divide. Politically irrelevant South, but an economically robust South will lead to tensions, like it or not, with a politically dominant but economically slow moving North. Battles over equitable distribution of resources are already taking place. They will sharpen post the 16th Finance Commission, and I see that widening. And finally, because we're also in a civil society space, I see less and less space for dissent. The targeting of NGOs, which has taken place in an extremely unfortunate manner, when an institution like the Center for Policy Research, and we may have some people here who sit there, and the manner in which that institution has been targeted and the criminalization of dissent by using even organizations like the Enforcement Directorate and this terribly punitive law called the PMLA uh, to target people simply because they may have alternate opinions or because those institutions may not necessarily toe the line, I think it creates a fearful society of a kind that India was never meant to be. And yes, Rao, let me say this, and this is why, let me end on a more hopeful note. Why I call it a quasi-autocracy, while I call it a quasi-autocracy, I think also, or I hope, India is so remarkably diverse that any attempt to bring in uniformity will, beyond the point, lead to resistance and a backlash. Even as we speak in this lovely five-star air-conditioned room, be clear, there is a protest somewhere in some corner of the country, either on paper leaks, an issue that my friend Saurabh's Lallan Top has been taking up, but sadly most other media does not, unpaid wages, delayed justice, or as we witnessed in Manipur, in uh, the deepening ethnic fault lines, 
and and saddeningly and as i said unfortunately there isn't enough attention being paid to issues like that so net net rahul don't give up on indian democracy but don't be complacent either because else we are hurtling towards becoming a quasi autocracy quasi autocracy is my you asked me before the show throw up a word i think we are moving towards a quasi autocracy i just read a book revenge of power and uh, every every sign of what is there he he has three p's the author moises naim post truth polarization and populism and i see all three starkly in our face in this country at the moment i want to go across to see that zarabi managing editor at business today television uh, to look into his crystal ball and tell us how he seem, sees the governance framework evolve over the next 5 years if prime minister modi were to be reelected siddhat uh, i think one of the key things that we need to put up right here is uh, consequent to the supreme court's uh, judgment and the plan for one india that has also been submitted uh, by the panel led by former president ramnath kovind uh reform of electoral finance reducing the number of elections and the cost that is incurred by the indian economy by indian corporates and indian society will be one of the key pillars that has emerged some days ago when the prime minister held his last meeting of the council of ministers and this was where they were all told to first have a plan for 2047 viksit bharat and also a 100 day agenda to sort of hit the ground running once the government comes to back to power that's what the council of minister was told i think there will be three key programs on economics and i would say that rather than looking at the politics and imagining certain scenarios modi 3.0 will be clearly focused on governance and economic reform in that one of the key reasons for the success of this government has been taxation reform more on the indirect tax front you will now see direct income tax reform also coming into the agenda hopefully this july or maybe later that can't be predicted the second is a continuing expansion of infrastructure which beyond the drawing rooms and television news rooms and the debates that we tend to do in one direction will actually change the life of ordinary indians you already see people saying hey we just travel 30 kilometers one side to go to work that's changing the way suburban india rural bharat is connecting with urban uh, centers of growth and that will be a key societal change driver as well because our cities will come under pressure and our cities which are melting pots will therefore have to respond the third bit really where we will see a lot of uh, action and change will be the ability of states and their delivery of goods of governance in that the divide between the so called revd culture as the bjp calls it as the prime minister has described it and those states which are progressive will come to the forefront so just to summarize rahul i think modi 3.0 and what we can expect beyond the doomsday predictions will be economics governance reform and continuing to ensure that public goods reach uh, the last person and are delivered smoothly without corruption through the last mile thank you so that's very useful you got some food for thought going rashti wants to jump in sorry yes. i i before i and but i forgot the fourth big divide uh, which is uh, religion i mean just think about it we are talking about apki bar 400 par 350 par this government at the moment in parliament does not have a single muslim mp this 350 400 par is also probably not going to have a single muslim mp 13% of your population in a way is being invisibilized how many muslims i don't want to say it in this room also but i know in my own colony which is an affluent up market colony how many muslims live there today there is a systematic invisibilizing of the muslim i'm not saying i'm not blaming an individual for it but this is the nature of it an indoctrination has set in and i think since we are in a media conclave we in the media should also look inside how much have we done to spread these kinds of stereotypes prejudice and the worst kind of hate politics that targets people because of the community they belong to nothing can be more dangerous for india the future the country with the third largest muslim population if the party in power with 400 mps cannot throw up a single muslim mp or cannot actually actively promote a sense of genuine cooperation between communities don't blame anyone and we in the media need to look inwards
I forgot that. That's why. Let's put for thought. We are getting some claps as well, and there's some people who. There should be louder claps. Louder claps. Some people not necessarily very happy.